Okay, all right, we're back. So, so we just looked at, you know, so, all right, so let me just start checking off what we've done. So we looked at some motivation and basic definitions of spectral sequences, so that's out of the way. And we've just looked at um, the, our first example of a spectral sequence, um, known as the Seri spectral sequence, and we looked at three different applications of this. And um, so yeah, we looked at three different applications of this, and um, you know, there, it's quite interesting how even though it was a spectral sequence about cohomology, we managed to obtain so much information about homotopy and. Uh, and you know the, uh, the I like to think that the actual computations themselves were also quite interesting. Um, so okay, now we move on to the attire. Um, here's a Baruch spectral sequence. But before we do that, because because the uh, uh, I'll just call it the AHSS um, <laughs> because it's um, to do with. Um, I like to think of it as generalizing the seri spectral sequence to generalized cohomology. Um, we actually need to look at generalized cohomology and spectra themselves before we can um, move on to talking about uh, spectral sequence involving them. And um, I'm quite glad that Kesar joined because uh, uh, he's been learning algebraic K theory. Uh, um, and yeah, spectra, uh, you know, they uh, arise there. Um, uh, they can uh, you can represent algebraic K theory with spectra, uh, I believe. Um, so you know that's there. So okay, there's plenty of reasons for studying spectra. Um, as I said, you know they they can re represent lots of different invariants such as algebraic K theory. Um, now, from the topological perspective, I like to think of spectra as just being a tool for representing. Different things, which different phenomena, which we see, which we um, can study, uh, you know, like K theory and uh, cohomology and so forth. But actually, from a commutative algebra perspective or higher algebra perspective, um, spectra are actually quite interesting things to study f just for studying spectra, because they can they normally carry extra structure that can make them a ring. If we have a suitable category of spectra, and um, you know, uh, now we're brushing upon sort of like higher algebra, stable infinity category type things, but um, if we can equip some <coughs> this suitable category with something that looks like the tensor product, um, and I believe that this turns out to be the smash product, um, you can actually end up with something that looks like a derived category. Um, now, okay, yeah, as I said before, the ring spectra. Uh, what these are known as are, you know, they're really interesting to study just by themselves, but for this talk, we're just using spectra as a tool to study generalized cohomology, so not for this talk. Um, anyway, as I was saying before, yeah, uh, spectra generalized repre <coughs> spectra represent generalized cohomology, and um, brown represent representability. Um, what it says is that any homotopy functor E um, which satisfies the eilenberg maclean axioms, can be written as... Um, sorry, I, I really shouldn't have picked E as the letter, but let's just say K for now. Let's just say K. Um, can be written like this, and E is a spectrum. So it's so it's of the form um, homotopy, based homotopy classes of maps between X and some spectrum E. Uh, okay. So, the way that I like to think of spect spectra are studying um, spaces, studying objects of top um, under suspension. So, how do they stabilize under suspension? You know, what happens? Um, this is what spectra is studying. That's how I like to think of them. Um, and the more precise definition is. <coughs> A sequence, E n, <coughs> for uh, indexed by the integers, and there are maps epsilon n between the suspension of E n and E n plus one. Now, okay, remember that um, the suspension and the loop space are a joint, so because um, this will correspond to a map 
between e n uh, and the loop space of e n plus one. And if let me just put this in pink so that you know it's not always going to happen. If it is a homotopy equivalence, we say that it's an omega spectrum. Um, so okay, uh, I don't know how many people in the talk, uh, in the audience haven't already fallen asleep. Um, but okay, in this slide, I kind of uh, thought that maybe uh, you guys could, you know, think of some spectra because there are some really simple ones, like the, for example, the suspension spectrum. Because well, you know, if we take a space x um, and we define uh, e n to be this n suspension of x, then obviously the maps are just going to be the identity, right? Because um, uh, the suspension of the suspension is just n plus one suspension. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gets the ball ball rolling. Uh, uh, just as a side note, the the actually the cohomology theory, which is represented here, is stable cohomology, which is represented by this. But okay, whatever. Um, so I don't know if you guys can think of any spectra yourself, but uh, you know, even if it's a simple one, it's a even if it's a silly sounding one, just anything. Um, yeah. All right, we have quite a few mute people, so uh, okay, I'll, I'll get the I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, one could say, um, by uh, talking about the sphere spectrum, which is normally denoted with this math BBS type thing. Um, and what it is, is, well, EN is equal to the N sphere, and um, the maps epsilon N between the suspension of the N sphere and the N plus 1 sphere, well, that's obviously just going to be a homeomorphism, right? Uh, so that's another simple example. Uh, one example where we talk about the loop and omega spectrum is the eilenberg maclean spectrum, H, which is denoted HA for some abelian group A. Um, and what this is, well, uh, okay, uh, EN is going to be K of A N, and uh, this is uh, an omega spectrum because, well, we do have homotopy equivalences between the loop space of, sorry, not the loop space, uh, between k of a n and the loop space of k of a n. So, um, I don't know if there's any, for example, there's a, there's a bunch of spectra which arise in Bordism, um, you know, simply because uh, because that's a generalized cohomology theory, and there's a thom spectrum. I don't remember how it's defined, but it's denoted M O. We have a M spin for different types of. Uh, we have uh, you know different types of borders. You know, represent uh, are represented by different types of spectra. Um, so you know, there's a bunch of different uh, spectra which arise really naturally uh, as well. Okay. So now let's look at a couple of examples of generalized cohomology theories. So yeah, okay, again, so we write HG for the eisenberg plane spectrum, and it represents singular cohomology because of this um, um, nice um, identification. Also complex K-theory, uh, also real K-theory Theory has another analog, but we're not going to talk about that one because it gets a bit complicated. Because it's because real K theory is eight periodic, so um, you know the, there's going to be it's going to be quite a detailed one to explain. But um, complex K theory is quite simple. Um, you you have a spectrum with K U to N being the integers cross B U, and um, K U N plus one being just a Loop space of the classifying space of the infinite unitary group. Then, okay, so we have that um, if we denote uh, by this, uh, this, uh, this should be, these should be base maps too. Um, um, we have that the zeroth reduced K theory group of X is literally just given by the. Um, 
what's called a zeroth um, uh, element of this spectrum. Uh, and, um, well, as you may know, if you were at my K-theory talk, um, this spectrum is periodic. And uh, this is because Bot periodicity says that this is true. And why do you think, what, you may think, why does this imply that it's periodic? Well, because this means that KU 2n plus 1, loop space of that is just going to give you back your KU 2n. And it's also going to give you back your KU uh, 2n plus 2. So it's periodic by 2. Um, uh, and again, I said, can you think of more? But based on the response on the other slide, I'm, I'm just not going to bother with that unless someone immediately unmutes and uh, shouts out another example. But, um, okay. Okay, so now it's just a slight brief interlude just so that you knew what we were working with. The main bulk of this part of the talk is obviously the actual spectral sequence we're dealing with. So before I actually go on to the statement of it, um, just a little bit of history is that um, the entire here's the uh spectral sequence um, uh, actually Adams credits this discovery to Whitehead, um, but Whitehead actually um, in Adams's text on um, stable cohomology theory, uh, sorry. <laughs> homotopy theory and generalized homology, um, he actually credits quite a few things to Whitehead, um, but says that Whitehead is all, uh, like was modest, you know, about it, and you know, didn't take any credit for it. Um, so in the end, the reason that's named after a tie in here's a book, is that um, they just use it as a folk theorem, uh, literally just for the case when uh, the generalized cohomology theory in hand is K theory. So without with that out of the way. We can take a look what it is. Um, so, if we have a generalized cohomology theory E and a vibration which looks like this, with a B path connected and a CW cell complex, but then we have a spectral sequence um, which looks like this. Oh god, that is horrendous. Um, which looks like that basically, and. Um, Recall that when E is equal to H sing, so singular cohomology, we just get back our seri-spectral sequence, right? Um, so it is a generalization of the seri-spectral sequence to um, generalized cohomology. Now, um, some people call this <coughs> the seri attire here is book spectral sequence because of this fact that it's a generalization. But and what they call the attire here is the spectral sequence is when F is equal to just a point, then we get this vibration here. So we relate sing singular cohomology with coefficients in uh, a generalized cohomology, and we relate it to generalized cohomology of the same space. Um, so, this is why um, this precise statement here is sometimes just given as the statement of attire here's a roof, and then this is a separate thing called the attire here's a roof spectral sequence. Um, you might see that in some places, but okay. Uh, we're going to be mainly working with this one anyway. Okay, so the point schematically, I guess the the strategic thing here is that if E star is something like a K theory, that you're supposed to you're supposed to be able to extract data about the the more complicated generalized cohomology theory yeah. using uh, yeah. the simpler stuff. Is the point? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, note in this case that uh, I, I guess, guess we don't really need. Uh, well, I guess in the other case we didn't really need to find. We could just construct vibration like this, and then uh, we can get uh, information if we know the. No, the normal cohomology of that space, then hopefully we can use that to get the generalized cohomology, like K-theory or something like that. Um, which is why uh, in this particular case is sometimes just stated as the entire the here's the roof spectrum, and uh, the other one is you know, given a separate name. Okay, so we're going to look at an example, the complex K-theory of 
CPN, and um, it's going to be um, p plus one copies of the integers for even n, and it's going to be zero otherwise. Okay, as per usual, we're going to start off by looking at the E2 page. So, we're going to look at, again, we're going to look at the case where we just plug in a point here, and then we can relate the, because we know the thing of the cohomology of CPN, um, so that's how we're going to try and find this. Now, the k theory of a point is simple, it's just the integers when q is even and zero otherwise. So therefore our E2 page becomes this, so when it's only non-trivial when q is uh, even, and is zero otherwise. Now, we also know the, co the cohomology of CPN, so this further becomes the integers if both q and p are even, and also zero has to be, p has to be between zero and two n, and it's zero otherwise. So let's take a look. I'm just gonna, because I don't wanna draw like a massive axis, I'm just gonna say that for now, n equals two. Um, so, so, okay, so let's say, okay, let's say we have four, three, two, one, uh, zero. And here we have zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, uh, what's going to happen in here? Let me just change the size of the pen. Okay, so, um, here we're going to get the integers, the integers, the integers. But because we're, let's just say we're working with CP2, um, all of this stuff above here is, oh, sorry, wait, no, that's when Q, sorry. That's when Q is big, sorry, sorry. It's, it's going to be all of this stuff here, because this is when P is bigger than 4, all of that stuff is going to die. Um, these columns here are going to be trivial, and I'm going to get Z2, 0, Z0, 2. Trivial stuff, Z0, Z0, Z, zero, Z, trivial stuff. Okay, now, we want to find a non-trivial differential, as per usual. So let's try D2. That's going to go across 2, this is looking promising, but it only goes down by 1. Not good. Bad. And uh, you know it's always going to go like this, and so forth. Uh, it's going to go like this, uh, you know, and so on. Not good. Let's now try um, D3. That's going to go across 3, and then down 2. So it's going to go down enough, but it's going to go across too much. You know, uh, it's going to go down enough, but across too much. Okay, let's not give up. Let's try D4. Um, now, this is going to go across by 4, good. But it's going to go down by 3. So it's, not gonna, so it's going down not enough. And the, the reason that this is happening is because, well, because the differentials are all by three, this, this, at least one of the, one of these is always odd, right? You know, we have a case star in the audience now, having a number theoretic proof of this. Okay, <laughs> you know, this is common sense, you know. Uh, one of these is going to be odd. Uh, if r is even, say 2, then this is going to be odd, and if, of course, if r is odd, then this is going to be uh, even. So, all of these people are going to be trivial, and so it collapses at the E2 page. Actually, I'm not going to delete this, I'm just going to delete some of the arrows, so that it's simpler to see. Because this is the E infinity page, and we're not going to uh, we're not going to run into any of these uh, extension problems. Um, what we can just do is to get our uh, PK group, we're just going to sum along the P the diagonal um, where for uh, uh, like for example uh, of all of these P plus Q equal to n. So let's say we want to find K for of CP2, right? So, 
We're going to have this guy. Now, 3 1 is not going to do anything. 2 2, that's good, that's another integer. 3 1 again, nothing. Integer again. So, when we sum along that, that's going to be three copies of the integers, please. Uh, nice, that coincides with our other result. And hopefully, you can see how this summing along, so along here, so if we have K2, CP2, uh, we get, uh, you know, uh, two copies of the integers, <coughs> and so on. So hopefully you can see how, in general, um, what we're going to get is um, this result here. Um, that the, m the nth cohomology of Cp n is equal to this thing here. Um, and uh, it's going to be zero otherwise because uh, you know, um, oh, there, there are going to be diagonals where uh, everybody is uh, trivial. Okay. Okay, so now we're actually going to um, take a slight detour here. And um, before we've been looking at lots of computations, you know, we haven't really been too bothered about precisely what the differentials are. But now we're going to stop that thinking for a little bit. Because <coughs> the differentials in, firstly the differentials in, the entire, in this spectral sequence are interesting. Um, but also because if we know the differentials, you know, again, that, that's going to give us information about the pages of our spectral sequence, uh, which is what we want. And, um, uh, uh, okay, obviously the differential is not always going to be so easy to compute, so it's always good to have techniques for computing them. And um, for the entire Hirzebruch spectral sequence, um, they, lie in, they lie in the form of k-invariants. So let's say we have a spectrum with one non-trivial homotopy group. And, uh, okay, I should probably mention um, that the homotopy group of the spectrum is equal to the limit over this k, sorry, over this n, is uh, of uh, pi k plus n of e k. Right? So if you want to think about an example of this, um, if, say, for example, our spectrum was the suspension spectrum, then this would just be stable co, sorry, uh, stable homotopy groups, for example. Uh, so that's our definition of uh, homotopy groups of spectrum. Um, so let's say that there's only one non trivial homotopy group, pi n of e. Um, then we get that e is a shift of an eilenberg maclean spectrum. Now, this works out nicely when there's one non-trivial homotopy group, but when there's two non-trivial homotopy groups, it doesn't quite work out as nicely. It does, we'll see, it does work out somewhat nicely, but it's not as convenient as this. Um, for some cases it does. For some cases it is just a wedge of two shifts of the eilenberg maclean spectrum, but, in general, they always fit nicely into a fiber sequence with two eilenberg maclean spectra. And how do we get this? Well, let's say we have this right here, um, this map phi here. What we do is, we take the cofiber of this map phi to obtain a map called k. And this k right here, we'll see, we'll see examples of k, uh, in a second, but we can see we have this two shifts of the eilenberg maclean spectrum, and we just have our E here. So that's good. And um, our map, which we desire, was this K, which was the cofiber of the map phi. And um, we'll see a few examples of K invariants in a second. This map K is called a K invariant, and um, we'll see how this uh, all works and why this is related at all to what we're talking about um, in a second. So. Um, okay. Um, 
Let's see, uh, do I have anything written here? Uh, oh, actually I do have something interesting written here. Um, firstly, uh, first application of this is that a spectrum with two non-trivial homotopy groups is a wedge sum of shifts of the eilenberg maclean spectra if and only if this k invariant is trivial, is equal to zero. Um, now, k invariants are examples of stable cohomology operations. And so, stay with me on this detour, um, because when we, uh, you know, when once this detour is complete, we'll be able to, we'll be in a nice position to describe the differentials of the, the spectral sequence. Um, so, just stay with me here. Firstly, we need to talk about stable cohomology operations, and it's just an, a stable cohomology operation is one which is a natural transformation like this, which commutes with the suspension. So, uh, of course, the stableness means that it commutes with the suspension, so if we just drop this condition, we drop this condition. Yeah. Um, so that's our definition. So let's just take a few look at some examples. So the Bockstein homomorphism is an example. Uh, I forgot to add the zero on the end of this short exact sequence. Um, so that's an interesting example. But over the integers, stable cohomology operations aren't interesting at all. Really, they just, really it's just drop torsion. Um, uh, you know, uh, reduce. And then Bockstein. That's what it is for over, over the integers. However, over these finite fields, there's a very different story. It's it, it, that's when they get interesting. Actually, we'll look over Q in a second. That they they're even more trivial than over the integers. But uh, okay, let's look at over um, the, the, these finite, finite fields. fields. This leads us to look at the Steenrod algebra. Well, why I like to think of the Steenrod algebra is, is as follows. Um, so, say we want to have a cohomology operation, which takes us, you know, it takes us from here to, and it doubles the degree. That's what we want to do, mod p. And the, na the, ver like, you know, the very natural way to do this is with x cut x. Right? But we run into a problem. It isn't natural, and it isn't even a homomorphism. Because, of course, uh, x plus y squared is not equal to x squared plus y squared. Sorry, no, that's not... Is that what I want to say? Uh, the cup... Uh, sorry, uh... I feel like that is, uh... Yeah, that is what I want to say, yeah. That, that, uh, it's not equal to x squared plus y squared. But, when p equals 2, so mod 2, this is true. So, we can, uh, so mod 2, that's true. It rhymes, so it must be true. Um, but it isn't natural, and it isn't stable. So, mod 2, there's only one solution solved. But, the steenroid squares come in and save the day. So, what they are is a set of cohomology operations. <coughs> um, mod, um, sorry. The set of cohomology operations um, of mod over mod 2 cohomology form a graded mod 2 algebra under composition, and it's generated by these steenroid squares here. And the way that they're defined is actually axiomatically. So there are five axioms which uniquely define the Steenrod squares. And they're as follows. So, okay, firstly, we have to actually solve the problem that we were having before. You know, there have to be homomorphisms, natural and stable. Um, we have the square zero, so the one that sends Hn back to itself. Um, it's just going to be the identity. Square one is our friendly face. It's the connecting homomorphism. 
in the long exact sequence in the long exact sequence associated to this short exact sequence. Then, when the degree of x is n, so when we are in here, uh, and we're, we're so okay when we're mapping out to two n, then we get back our precious x squared. But when the degree of x is less than n, square n of x is zero. And how does it behave under products? Well, this formula here, I like to think of it as as follows. So if we define just square x as being the sum over from i equals zero to infinity of of all of these square i's, then it's multiplicative. So that is square of x y is equal to square x square y. So that's just an alternate def uh, alternate um, way of seeing this thing here, like that. So these five axioms. Sorry, no, I went too far. These five axioms uniquely define the Steenrode squares. Furthermore, they define their action on mod 2 cohomology of spaces. So, okay, these axioms are quite powerful. They're not too difficult either. Um, but, okay, there's also a relation which one can just derive. So, I think that some people list this in the definition, but actually, this is actually a theorem which we can derive from the axioms. And it's called the ADEM relation. And um, it describes how the squares um, um, behave under composition. And, uh, you know, uh, they, it's, it's not the neatest formula. Let's, let's be honest, it's not the neatest formula. But, you know, it's there. And, you know, might as well know this just in case you need to, you know, implement it or something. Um, so, yeah. Those are two quick facts about the steam root squares. So... We've taken a detour, we've looked at k-invariants, and, and therefore we've looked at stable cohomology operations. So now you might be thinking, why is this guy wasting my time? I thought I was going to learn about spectral sequences, and instead he's blabbing on about cohomology operations. Um, well, okay, never fear. We're coming back to the attire, the, the spectral sequence, okay? Because now... We actually um, have a description <coughs> of the first non-trivial differential in the cohomological attire Heraser spectral sequence, um, and we can identify it with a k-invariant. So this is why I went on the C floor. So first of all, let's say we have a spectrum E, where we have um, this part not equal to zero, this part not equal to zero, but this thing is equal to zero when k is between q and q plus r. Okay? Um, then, what we have is the first non trivial differential in the cohomological attire Heerseberg spectral sequence from these two uh, elements of the r plus one page. <coughs> um, this can be identified with the following k invariant here. And we'll see examples of this in k theory um, in a second. I'll see I'll, I'll show you what this looks like in k theory, because this is the that's the only place where I'm comfortable with this happening. Like um, I know that you can there's all different types of bordism where this is also very useful for computations, but I, I really don't know much about that, so um, uh, we'd have to go on a post talk Wikipedia dive if we want to talk about that. Um, but okay, this is actually really useful. Um, so for interesting examples, this is often enough for us to talk about spectral sequence computations. Um, unfortunately, this is just the first one, <laughs> and it's already getting complicated. For higher differentials, they're determined by higher cohomology operations. Hard. These are really hard things to uh, talk about, so we're not going to talk about them. Um, instead, we'll talk about nice examples. <laughs> um, 
such as complex K-theory. And complex K-theory admits only one K-invariant. Remember, remember that it's two period. No, go away. Remember that it's two periodic. What am I doing? What is going on? Apologies. Remember that it's two periodic. So it only admits one K invariant. And this is actually given by this composition here. You might be wondering what the map R is. R is, e is equal to reduce. Uh, mod 2, since we're dealing with steam and and stuff, and the k invariant is given by this, and um, you might be thinking what the good this is, well, this means that we've computed d3, if we talk about the, if we talk about um, k theory in our, in our spectral sequence calculations, uh, with complex k theory, because it's so nicely behaved, we can talk about uh, d3 straight away, and um, this is often written as square 3 with a subscript instead of a superscript, but that's quite confusing. Um, now, um, real k-theory is 8 periodic, so we get 4 k-invariants, and um, the way I like to remember the homotopy groups of k-theory is by singing twinkle twinkle little star, so we have um, z2, z2, 0, z, 0, 0, 0, z. And it actually worked like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Wait, 2, 4, 6. Yeah, exactly. Those are the, those are the eight homotopy groups here. And it's eight periodic. Um, so that's just a nice little way to remember it. Um, but anyway, th this is what they look like. And we get 4k invariants. Um, so we get uh, we get a bunch of differentials for free, basically, um, which we can talk about when we're dealing with real k theory in our calculations. And they're given by these compositions here. Um, so okay. Um, the final thing I'll look at is um, stable homotopy theory over the into uh, sorry not into rational numbers, and um, Actually, stable homotopy operations, they're not, they're not only simple over Q, they're trivial over Q. And so, in turn, because the differentials of the entire Heerzebuch spectral sequence are so closely related to stable homotopy theory, it means that it's much simpler over Q. But no, 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 I'm not going to leave you with this, you know, vague uh, statement. It's so much nicer over the uh, the rational numbers. All extension problems and all differentials are trivial. So you could li you can literally for any comp no matter how complex as long as it's over the integers uh, in rationals and we're doing an entire here is a broke spectral sequence. You can rush in headfirst with the approach that has been that we've been doing in this talk without having to worry about any extension problems at all. Um, and actually, there's an even stronger statement, which is that the infinity category of rational spectra is equivalent to the infinity category of chain complexes over the rationals. Okay. So, basically, it's really nice over the rationals. What next? Well, we have barely touched the surface. Um, I didn't talk about Bordism at all in this talk, and it's actually a really large area where this is applicable. Um, now, again, I don't know much about Bordism, so I didn't feel confident to talk about Bordism at all in this talk. Um, but Thom showed that this MO, which is the spectra which represents unoriented Bordism, is a wedge sum of shifts of the eilenberg maclean spectrum. Um, uh, you know, uh, from before, remember, only the nice ones, which have k invariant equal to zero, um, behave like that. Um, so yeah, the k invariants are trivial, and also the Atai Hirazabruk spectral sequence collapses at the E2 page, and we don't have to think about extension problems. So, that makes our 
um, unoriented borders and calculations uh, neater. Um, secondly, in homotopy groups of spheres. I mean, actually, I'm not too aware of the... I don't think this is the one of the main spectral sequences which is applicable in this way. Um, unless you go like, oh, but it's a generalization of the seri-spectral sequence, so by extension it must be, you know, uh, applicable in all of the areas where the seri-spectral sequence is applicable, but okay. Apart from that, um, uh, you know, there are some results which one can derive um, from this entire Heeresbruch spectral sequence um, relating to homotopy groups of spheres. Unfortunately, I don't know much about them, but I think that there's one, I think that there is a result which is that um, the nth cohomology groups of CP infinity wedge itself are isomorphic to the nth cohomology group, uh, sorry, homotopy groups of the three sphere for n bigger than or equal to three. I believe that this is an application of the entire Heresbrook spectral sequence. Um, but yeah, um, again, there's so many different um, generalized cohomology theories that appear naturally in maths that uh, there's obviously going to be stuff that I've missed um, in this talk, but, but you know, there's just a brief taste. Uh, I, I picked these two spectral sequences to talk about because the first one was very, you know, you know, pretty quick applications which we got, you know, um, very neat stuff which we can derive um, and compute and so forth by just generally using a general strategy of um, spectral sequences and spectral sequence computations. Um, whereas with this half of the talk, we talked more about techniques for computing differentials. Okay, for okay, we had one. Um, example of computing the K-theory of CPN. I actually think that that was the first application. I think that's why they even used it, Ataya and Hirasabra, in the first place. I think that's why they used it in the first place. But um, uh, this half of the talk was more about focusing on the differentials. And, um, you know, um, once we could do that, we could, um, we could immediately know when... Um, we would have extension problems, or when the spectral sequence is going to collapse. And, you know, that's the more theoretical side of, you know, um, computing spectral sequences, but, you know, it's quite a satisfying one, too. So, um, uh, hopefully that was an interesting side to see as well, uh, of spectral sequences. And, um, yeah, so that's both parts complete. Um, now, I have a suspicion that, um, Mr. C. Furco is lurking, waiting to ask a deep question. Um, so uh, before before that, um, I'm just going to stop recording and then, uh, you know, we can just discuss or whatever um, for a little bit. So, uh, yeah, thank you for watching if you're watching on YouTube and um, yeah, goodbye. Uh,